Well, welcome everyone to our uh, study session tonight. We appreciate your attendance and it's good to see everybody. You can see in here outside, you can't see anything. I about had to turn my GPS on to get here. Uh, let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, we've kind of uh, some of these items there under the first uh, bullet point we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, Superintendent Lamp, go ahead. Yes, board, I sent you some information just as to preview over the last couple of weeks on a couple of these items, but let's celebrate first. Um, we have Westfield High School open to students. That happened uh, yesterday. Yes, that was a round of applause. And, uh, <laughs> yep, and this is a relieved individual sitting back there and his, his, his partner in crime. So we appreciate all the hard work. Um, and then we have Westfield High School open to students. That happened yesterday. Yes, that was a round of applause. And there's a relieved individual sitting back there and his partner in crime. So we appreciate all the hard work. Um, they held some student orientations prior and allowed teachers some time to get into Westville to get settled. As you know, we still have uh, a bit of finished work to do, but we are open for business. And if you were at the football game or anybody was at the football game, first home game, um, historical night, last Friday night, it was standing room only for seating on the home side. So the community is super excited about that opening. Uh, Haven Bay will open this coming Monday. Uh, as you know, our students have, have been bused to two different schools for the time being. They started on August 21st. They've been attending Hupper and Canesville. We want to thank those communities for being such great hosts. But we will open Haven Bay, and again, there will be parts of the building that will continue to be worked on. Board, I'll, I'll, I'll be working with you on this, but we'd like to do a, a ribbon cutting and open house process for both of those schools, but we want to get them a little further along, if that's okay. So we're thinking towards the end of September. Get for them. those in first. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I will reach out to you with some options there and get your feedback on that, but we will make sure we get that information out to the communities. Superintendent? Yes, sir. How was Westfield Open House? It was awesome. It was awesome. I, I know that we had several people attend uh, the Open House plus the orientations. We walked through the building with the staff the day before, and I, it was palpable how excited the staff was to get in the building, and I guess it was about the, the three or four days before. Uh, but uh, really good reports back from the students. We bused the students to the school, and uh, they were able to walk around and took a tour, and uh, we just had a lot of good feedback. Uh, Clyde, you were there for one of the days. Brock and others were there. Yesterday. How was yesterday's opening? It was, it was great. Okay, it was, yeah, no, it, I think it went really well. I think the kids were excited to be there. Yeah, Clyde, you want to speak to it? You were there in the morning. Yeah. You got carpet in the, in the commentary? Sure. As of yesterday, no. <laughs> Wrong <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the students was just moving about the building. I mean, it's, a lot of kids were lost, but so was the staff, so they was lost together. <laughs> but they was helping one another get around and find their way. And, and the kids, I, I was out there doing the first ones, and see them in the commons and in the cafeteria was really, really great to see. So, so was it moving with that amount of kids? I mean, what, we got what half of we can put in that, and it was moving pretty good. Yeah, the flow was really good. So, uh, really good flow coming down the stairs, going to the cafeteria. Awesome, great flow. We only yeah. do that about once every thirty years. Yeah, you want to celebrate it, right? That's not it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, good things happening there and a lot of hard work, many individuals, thank you. Uh, we've been rolling out the strategic plan. I just wanted to update the board. Uh, we rolled it out to the Bonneville Cone Schools last Wednesday and today we, we visited with the, the Fremont Cone Schools. We met with the, the elementary schools from Fremont at Mountain View today and then moved quickly over to Fremont High and met with the secondary and spent some good time with our employees. It's always great to, to meet with our employees and we're hoping that they're feeling excited about this, this forward motion with the plan. Uh, and then lastly, board, I gave you some information about kind of where we are right now with the Utah Fits All Scholarship. Um, you know, I've, I've been in, in talks with many superintendents at our superintendents meetings. Everybody's been trying to figure out, where, do we become a vendor for the Utah Fits All? Do we not? If so, if, you know, why, why not? 
And we've decided after much conferring and discussion amongst district leadership that for right now we're going to do what most of the districts are doing and just kind of hold. We're going to hold. There's too many unanswered questions about it. We don't have any data that tells us much about how many of our, our county's kids are in, involved in that, how many scholarships have been awarded. There's quite a process that you have to go through to become a vendor. And, and so we thought it would probably be best, best prudent to wait for a bit. That doesn't mean that we might not change our tune as we, we have learned more about it, but to jump into it right now, we just didn't feel comfortable with that with a lot of unanswered questions. So we're one of, uh, there's only six districts right now that are vendors that have applied to be vendors, so we're in the majority uh, right now with the wait and watch and see uh, approach. Any questions about that scholarship? I, I sent you a couple of detailed emails that kind of laid out our, our why and what we know and what we don't know right now about the scholarship. Can you remind us do you, which six districts are? Yeah, so in your packet, I'm so glad you asked that, Kelly. I provided you some information in your packet for the six districts that are vendors right now. Alpine, Box Elder, Canyons, Iron County, Nebo, and Washington are the six that are participating. And we will be hearing from those districts in one of our next coming upcoming USSA meetings. And I'm sure they'll be able to provide us some insight about how that's going, okay? Any other questions? All right. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have a presentation. Uh, Dr. Peterson and Mr. Cooper, please. Hello, board. Um, uh, so, earlier um, uh, this month, well, no, last month, the uh, subcommittee of the board that deals with RDA, CRA, CDAs met uh, with uh, Mr. Cooper, Brandon Cooper. He's from Riverdale City. And um, they're proposing expansion to an existing RDA. And RDAs are, uh, uh, this one's kind of grandfathered in under old RDA rules. We've not seen this for a while. Uh, and he is going to give us a presentation and hopefully answer some of the questions we had at our subcommittee meeting. And then um, we don't take a vote. Um, uh, that's why we're here in the, in the, in the study session. And we will, uh, uh, Doug and I, or not Doug, about. Paul. I am already starting to get my board members mixed up. Um, I, I did that last board meeting. I'm uh, pres President Whittison. President, President Whittison and myself are the representatives of the board that attend a tax and energy committee, later on with representatives from other tax and entities, and we then vote um, uh, for the uh, approval of the budget. You've been around me too long. I know. You're rubbing off on my podcast. Yeah. Anyway, so we will have a, a, a Brandon, go ahead and present to us. Okay. Uh, thank you, Robert, for that present or for that introduction. As he had mentioned, uh, my name is Brandon Cooper. I'm the Community Development Director for Riverdale City. Uh, we have met with uh, your finance committee previous to this meeting, and so today we just uh, will be discussing, as uh, Robert has briefed, the West Bench RDA, this is a little bit different, as he mentioned, because it is a, an existing RDA, and I'll cover the timeline of that uh, for some clarity here in just a moment. And there is no direction, or excuse me, there is no vote tonight, it's just direction for the taxing entity uh, uh, committee members. This is the aerial map of where the area is. It's located in between I-15 and I-84, right there at the top of the hill. Uh, some of you might know that as uh, the Gibby Orchard. Uh, others might know it as the America First Campus. It's largely been vacant for uh, a long, long time, uh, except for some of the, the buildings that America First has occupied for a while. There is a significant amount of interest from America First and others in this area, but it lacks the infrastructure to support any type of significant development there. And so that's really the purpose of why the RDA was established in the first place and why we're amending it today. Here's a little bit closer look of that area. We have seen, seen some de recent development. Uh, there has been a Tesla dealership built there. It's uh, soon to open. There's been a Maverick built and some other things there. But uh, by and large, this is an area that lacks infrastructure for uh, the sustainment of, of future growth. So it's currently about 74 acres. Uh, it was established in 2005. 
It has a base year, if you're familiar with that term in RDAs, the base year is the year in which uh, it was valued in terms of its taxable value. That was established in 2011. It had an original term of 15 years, but then was extended for two additional years, which makes it 17 years total. So this is, again, an existing RDA in place right now. Uh, it is 100% participation by all of the entities, including the, uh, the school district. And so right now you're participating at 100% level. But because it has not triggered the tax increment collection period, uh, tax increment has not been collected by the agency. It has continued to flow through to the entities, and I'll explain that in, in just a moment. We have triggered the, co the collection period with the county, and, and that starts in 2025. So we, if nothing changes based on the, the, the re uh, upcoming tech vote, then we will have collections starting in 2025 uh, for tax year, or excuse me, 2026 for tax year 2025. So here's a timeline of some of those uh, dates, again, created in 2005. There was a, an amendment by the tech in 2019 that, looks at, that looked at the collection period and when that commencement began. That COVID extension was granted in 2021. And again, here we are uh, looking for an amendment. That orange bullet point there in 2012, that shows that it has a $9 million cap and 100% participation from all of the entities based on the original tech vote. I mentioned this is a key, a key area for America First. Uh, they are the largest project in the project area that we're looking to support, but there are other projects that will be um, possible there if the infrastructure is made available through uh, tax increment finance and some other um, key financing tools. Uh, housing is a big part of it. We look to see hopefully about 500 housing units there. Uh, we look to uh, see a couple of hotels, so up to 200 rooms for hotels, uh, some additional retail and commercial office as well, in addition to the America First Campus. And the America First Campus is, is, um, is an amazing endeavor. They're looking to consolidate most of their operations and to bring in about 7,000 employees in that area. Uh, some of the development objectives are to strengthen the tax base and to develop the vacant land. Uh, vacant land in, in this particular area is actually not doing any of the taxing entities any good as it has sat there vacant for many, many years. It's unproductive. Um, it, it's actually a liability and a cost. And so that's one of our major focuses is to look at undeveloped land in the city and return it to productive use. These are just some pictures of the corporate campus that currently exists for America First, they have a few buildings. They have added uh, one building in the last year uh, and some new road infrastructure, but that's about the level that this area can handle without the increase in infrastructure is what you see here. So if the tech was to not vote for the amendment, hopefully in October, uh, then this would be the limit to the development in that area based, based on what we see here. But the campus alone is a much bigger endeavor, as I mentioned. They are looking to build 10 new buildings uh, with the associated parking, and that's what you're seeing here. Uh, the salmon-colored areas are the undeveloped areas by America First that will be vacant for future development. So that's where the hotels would go, uh, some future housing, some retail and commercial. So a massive, massive area. Here's a rendering of what the first five buildings our plan to look like. Uh, this comes from America First. The two lower buildings on the bottom of the picture there are parking structures, and the five buildings that look similar are the office buildings that they would populate with their employees. Here's a rendering of what one of those buildings will look like. Uh, here's another view of the campus looking south. Uh, this is their first phase building and the associated parking structure. And then again, here's some uh, items that have been shown to uh, uh, occupy that vacant land, hospitality, retail, and some other things that would, that would complement the campus environment that America First seeks to create. As I mentioned, this project and, and the other projects that I've described would be infeasible unless there were to be made a significant amount of in, uh, infrastructure improvements, so traffic improvements, utility improvements, other things that are associated with development there. I've listed a few here. Our engineers have estimated that the present value of those um, new costs would be about $42 million. 
So you can see why development in this area hasn't happened in the last 40 years. There's a massive impediment uh, given um, the constraints of the two freeways, the lack of infrastructure uh, with the wet and dry utilities. Here's a map of what some of those infrastructure improvements would look like. You can see that the dark blue area is a new road, 1500 West, and then we've outlined some of the new infrastructure that would both support America First, the new development around it. Most of the infrastructure improvements that are significant and cost the most are related to traffic. With this amount of people coming to this area, there's a significant traffic issue. And so we seek to solve that by changing the intersection at Riverdale Road in 1500 West, um, changing the intersection there at 4400 uh, and, and 1500 West, potentially adding a new slip ramp that comes directly off of I-15 uh, into the project area, as well as some other uh, local enhancements. Uh, we've presented this to the county and other entities, and they are seeing the real regional benefit of some of these traffic improvements, not only to help alleviate Riverdale Road traffic, but to essentially provide for uh, north-south, or excuse me, east-west connections on 4400 into Roy um, and into Ogden. Here's a picture of some of those uh, new UDOT improvements associated with a new interchange there at I-15, and then there's the slip ramp um, in, the, uh, in the orange that would come directly into the project. So that would alleviate uh, the need to travel down Riverdale Road and take a left going uh, north on, on 1500. So the recap of the current budget is uh, on this slide here. As I mentioned, it's currently at 100% participation for all the entities, and they're listed there. Uh, for 17 years with a $9 million cap. And again, that's set to start to be collected in 2026 uh, for the 2025 uh, tax, tax year. What that means is that over the course of 17 years, the entities receive zero pass-through, so zero distribution of the, of the new valuation created. So what you're getting your revenue on in this area would be the 2011 taxable valuation. And I've illustrated um, some of that in, a, in another slide. Because we haven't triggered the current project area, and because you have been receiving um, your revenue on the current year's valuation, you've actually received $2.5 million to date, uh, even though this is an active project area. Uh, and that's over the last 14 years. The new proposed budget would do a couple of things. It would amend the budget and amend the project area. So the lower half of that blue section where you see that middle dividing line, I think I have a pointer, yeah. Uh, so this is the northern boundary of the uh, existing RDA, and then all of this up here would be the proposed amended RDA. And that is for the reason of accommodating the new development um, north of the existing campus and to encompass all of those infrastructure improvements. What we're proposing is a new participation rate at 80% and a, a couple of years longer at 20 years. What that would do is it would allow the entities to participate in the growth over the next 20 years, and I'll define that in just a moment, but it would give us the, the needed money to kind of tackle that $42 million uh, expense that we have for the infrastructure. You'll see that the present value of this new budget is $35 million. Um, what the resolution at the tech vote would be, it would be the 71, but we're talking in present value dollars of about 35 million. So there's still a shortfall, but because of America First commitment to this area, they're willing to participate um, in, in the gap, meaning that if the agency was able to participate with tax income and finance up to 35 million, then they would cover the additional uh, seven or eight million that it would take to fulfill the infrastructure needs. So here's a larger picture of that. The bottom uh, row there shows the property taxes that, this, that the uh, district would get, and this is in future value um, on the bottom, but every year we anticipate, based on the schedule of investment and the schedule of improvements that would be made, that uh, the district would receive anywhere from, in year one, about 41,000, and then in year 20, almost $890,000 a year on the new improvements. For a total, uh, accumulated effect over 30 years of about $6 million. 
and this is how we derive that. I know you can't see that, so we'll go to the big numbers. So what this means is that if the tech approved this amended budget, the school district would have a participation of about $20 million over the next 20 years. And again, that is future dollars. That is not dollars that you're currently receiving today. Those are dollars that are generated from the future investment. You've already received, as I've mentioned, about $2.5 million. And because it's an 80% participation instead of 100, you'll actually receive over that same 20 years, $6.3 million. So although the total commitment is 20, you'll actually receive 6.3. And then if you expand that out to another 10 years for a total of 30, you would have received uh, $17 million. So essentially what we're taking this land from is about a $41 million valuation today to almost a billion dollar valuation in 17 to 20 years. And so the difference of what you receive in terms of real dollars is significant. Um, and I think that by participating at the 80% instead of the already committed 100%, then you are actually receiving that revenue growth over the same period of time instead of having to wait the full 17 years to realize the, the recapture of that investment. And so what that means is after this project is finished, then you'll likely to receive a future value of about $1.26 million of new tax revenue off of this project um, for forever. That's the duration of the, of the investment. So here's the cap of that. Um, again, base year valuation, we're proposing to stay the same at 2011. Uh, the new base valuation, because we are increasing the geographic boundary, goes up to $24 million. Um, the project area expands a little more than double. Uh, the budget cap goes from $9 million to $71 million. But again, your cap specifically would be the 19.6. Uh, this is not like an interlocal agreement, which is what you're used to in the, in the recent past, where you negotiate that independently of all the other entities. It is a single resolution by the tech, but we can put provisions in there based on the budget itself of individual caps of, of 19 million in your case. And then just for comparison, because of the difference of the tax rates, uh, Riverdale City would, would be in at 80% as well, and the investment there would be about five and a half million. But again, because of our tax rate difference, our overall return over time would be much less as well. So that's a brief summary of uh, what the proposal is. And again, this is uh, meant to be taken to the tech committee, uh, hopefully on October 3rd for a, a vote by resolution. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Questions? You mentioned to us uh, a couple of weeks ago when we met the, the slip lane coming off of the freeway, one of those exists someplace in Salt Lake, and I can't remember where you told us that was. It's, uh, the, uh, it's in South Jordan, 106 South, uh, and it slips right into the South Town Mall going north. You go there every day. I never I'm very other I'm trying to trust it with me. Deb doesn't let me go that far from home. So. <laughs> Any questions for Brandon? Bruce? So just to clarify, if nothing is done, what would be what would be our collection? Because that's another thing we'd like to see is with the CRAs helps us compare with the CRAs and stuff that we've done recently. Uh, you know, we're already collecting X, mm -hmm. and then then now uh, we have potential to collect a lot more. Um, uh, what would what if we did nothing? What would our collection be? And and if we do if we go into this, what would our collection? Be? So the new collection would be on that bottom row, um, starting in year one. On top of what we're already collecting. Yes, this would be additional on top. So around 41 in the first year, because you're actually now just collecting on existing things that are there now, um, based on the new, um, the new valuation. And then that's what you would likely see over time as the investment schedule is met. And Trent, if you wouldn't mind toggling to that Excel spreadsheet, we can look at what uh, you are collecting today and what you have collected. Okay, I know this is a, somewhat hard to read. So if you look at row, um, row eight, so right now we have a, in 2021, actually Trent, do you mind sliding the sheet to the left there? Uh, other direction please, sorry, thank you. 
So in, in 2024, the, the project area as it currently is, is situated has a taxable valuation of about 46 million, $47 million. And based on your current tax rate in 2024, if you go to row eight, you're collecting um, about $255,000. And so based on the tech decision in October, if this was to be passed, then an additional 41 or 42,000 would begin immediately. And then as investment was made based on our schedule, then that would ramp up to the, um, I think it was 450, I can't remember now. We have Do you mind going back? There we go. So at the end of the 20 year investment period, 895,000. So that's good to know. That's kind of what I was visualizing because when people ask, well, um, uh, it, and it, it's, it's, it's good to be able to tell them, hey, we're partnering and we are receiving more than what, what we would otherwise receive if nothing is done. Plus adding all the jobs um, uh, and those kind of things that will help attract people to our community to, um, uh, you know, and that's a good thing. That's right. I, I do believe the 80% is, is good for the district, good for Riverdale City, good for the other entities. Um, there's a significant amount of investment that will be made in that 20 year period. It is hard to wait for the full period to get the, to realize the, the full amount of that investment return. And so to realize that each year as that value increases, I think is really good on top of what you are currently collecting and then in hopes of, of having that full valuation at the end. So, Brandon, we are going to continue to collect that. For, what was it? Four hundred thousand a year. You're going to co continue to collect what you currently are, which yeah, I which showed won't change. won't change. And then, because you're now participating in twenty percent of the yeah. new valuation, you'll get that as well. So that's a win-win. Yeah. On a partnership, I would say. Right. <clears throat> that's what I want to see. What is just the trajectory of what Does that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Your presentation, mm -hmm. Robert. Thank you for helping us do that. Uh, let's move on to some uh, departmental updates. Mary Jo Williams, please. <coughs> Superintendent Butters, President Woodison Board. Uh, we wanted to just, I'm assuming right now I'm talking about the Haven Bay updates. Okay. I know we have something else on the agenda too. So. Um, we just wanted to update you on the status of <clears throat> Haven Bay. Uh, we are planning to open Haven Bay Elementary on Monday, September 9th. Um, we know that it won't be completely finished, but we feel like it will be ready to um, accommodate students and uh, teachers. Uh, starting tomorrow and Thursday, I mean Thursday and Friday, we are allowing teachers to be in their classrooms to start preparing them for students on Monday. Um, what we have been able to do is we have instructional coaches who are going to be acting as substitutes in the classrooms at Hooper and Kingsville for those two days. And a big shout out to the curriculum department. They're the ones that prepared all of the substitute plans, um, which allowed the teachers basically to step out of their classrooms at Hooper and Kingsville and spend the next two days at Haven Bay, making sure that they're ready for, for students. Um, we have invited parents in to see Haven Bay on Friday, September 6th from 3.30 to 5.30, knowing that this is an opportunity for them to meet with teachers, but more just an opportunity for them to see their classrooms and see the school and know what's what it will look like on Monday when they arrive there at the, the school. Um, the school schedule, since we were able to start at Hooper and Kingsville on August 21st, we don't need to make up any missed time um, for those students. Um, Haven Bay will be on the same schedule as all of our other elementary schools, which means that school begins at 8.30, ends at 3.20 on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then of course we have the early out schedule on Wednesday, which is a dismissal at 12.20. Um, the busing schedules and stops that have been used to transport them to Hooper and Canesville um, are no longer accurate, but the new transportation schedule is on the um, bus locator and um, the community's been made aware of that and they can access that information. 
Um, for those who are going to be walking to school, I'm going to read this part so I get it right. Um, crossing guards are going to be stationed along 5100 West and in front of the school on 3300 South. The cities plan to have crossing guards on 5100 West at about 3500 South and another one at 3300 South. There will also be one directly in front of the school. Uh, West Haven City is still in need of one crossing guard. Um, the city has been working on installing the temporary walking path along 5100 West, and there is a new crosswalk, crosswalk in place at about 3500 South. And I know that Lane had an update today from the city talking about we don't have that uh, road wheel completely all the way along there. Um, there. It sounds like they're having some conversations with some of those homeowners to discuss if they want the road wheel, if there's something else that they can put in place in front of those houses. So I know that, but a good portion of that and if you haven't been out there and seen that walking path where the fence was moved and the walking path was put there to move students off the road um, we're very pleased with what the city was able to do and help us in that in that situation um, we also have made uh, the community aware that while the majority of the construction has been completed there are still some areas of the school that will remain under construction for a period of time um, we wanted them to know that those areas are secured and they're not going to impact student safety or access to any of the essential facilities and that the construction workers are not going to be interacting with the students that they will enter and exit the school through a separate entrance that was a question we had from a lot of the, the members of the community with some concerns that way so those are some basic updates just on the timeline of what's happening as we get the students and staff into Haven Bay Elementary. Do you have any questions that I could answer? Great job. Okay, thank you. Mary Jo, did you want to do the playground piece? <laughs> <laughs> She's been juggling I, a lot of things. So. I just look at the ramp, the ramp post. So I, I apologize, board and superintendent Butters. Um, Mary Hislop, our principal there, there was a miscommunication. She'll be here for the board meeting, but did not know that she needed to be here for the board study session. So I know that there was the memo that was shared. Um, about the playground at Country View Elementary, that there's been money raised for that um, through the RAP grant and through other sources. As you can see on the memo, um, the playground um, is ready to be installed. And so what we would like is just the approval for us to install that, that playground. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks. We'll, we'll vote on that in our regular board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Heidi Alder, please. Good evening, board. <laughs> um, we just have a couple of policies that we are reviewing or presenting on second reading, and three new policies, and then some one policy on consent and a number of policies to be repealed on consent. So that's your preview of what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> um, the first policy that is being presented on second reading is policy 5201. That's our bullying policy. We made some updates last month to some definitions to um, parent notification requirements. We added a section that allowed a parent to appeal a decision with regard to a bullying investigation and made some changes to the titles of some of our um, departments and um, coordinators that are no longer called coordinators. No comments have been submitted on that policy, so we would present that to the board to adopt during board meeting. Is there a sentence in that bullying po uh, policy that John has to be nice to me? You can add that. <laughs> Get away, Chan. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. On um, under training on eight, it talks about um, number four that training on bullying should happen to, or should be given to students, um, students, employees, or coaches participating in athletic, curricular, extracurricular club. Is that happening regularly? Do we have like, because my daughter's on the cheer team, I don't know that she received any bullying training. So I was just curious on that training piece. Yeah, there, there's some uh, training that's provided at the school level by athletic directors and, and, and administrators. But we have talked about this policy in terms of that's part of uh, the reason we're expanding the compliance and policy role so that we can provide better training, get the water to the end of the road. That's a great, great comment, Kelly. That's the goal. 
students do take that training at the beginning of the year on discrimination and yes. bullying, but it's a, it's a student body wide training and it's on Canvas, and I don't know how <laughs> attentive students are. Yeah. yeah, so we have talked about doing more training um, specifically around athletics in particular. The second policy that is up for second read is policy 6800. This is the Governmental Records Access Management Act. If you recall last month, we presented this policy because we realized that we were, it, our, our old policy had more steps than was necessary under the law. And so rather than make you all, the board, be an appeals body, we uh, took that step out and a person who wasn't satisfied with the superintendent's <coughs> response as an appellate person can take their um, next their next step would be to go to the appeal, the records committee, the grandma ombudsman, or to the um, Utah Court of Appeals. So there was also some new legislation that we added, new legislative language that we added to that policy. We didn't have any comments, and there was no changes made between last month and this month. We do have three new policies um, that we'd like the board to consider on first read. The first policy is 4120, Student Discrimination and Harassment Policy. And this policy primarily has changes to some of our terms and definitions as we've been training our administrators to do better at identifying discriminatory harassment in our schools. We wanted to be clear about what that looked like, that not all conduct is necessarily harassment, but it's still inappropriate in our schools. So we separated out discriminatory harassment and discriminatory conduct. To give you an example, when a student uses the N-word but not directed at a student of color and not targeting a student of color, it's not okay. We don't want racial epithets in our school whatsoever, but it's not necessarily harassment, but we're calling it discriminatory conduct. So the amendment to this policy fleshes out the definition of discriminatory conduct and provides a number of examples for administrators and for the public to understand what is harassment, what is discriminatory conduct, and then clearly prohibits both in our schools. We also modified our investigative procedures to align more with our bullying investigative procedures, but also to meet the requirements of federal law, which requires us to investigate promptly, thoroughly, and then also to take steps to effectively remediate the environment. Those are the changes made to policy 4120. Are there any questions about that policy? The next policy that is a new policy, 4195, we have not had a policy that is specific to procedures for creating and amending 504 plans for our students with disabilities that are not on an IEP. So we have students on IEPs if they meet the criteria for an IEP, but there are many students in our districts who have disabilities that don't meet the criteria for an IEP, but are also on an accommodation plan that we call a 504 plan. We have never had a policy surrounding procedures for creating those plans, for the meetings that have to be held, for the evaluations that have to be held. We followed the processes and we followed the law, but we realized that we needed to have a policy in place. And so the language in this policy is just articulating what we've already been doing in practice, which is best practice and also um, as, as is required by federal and state law. Any questions on policy 4195? Thank you. And then the last policy, policy 6600, is a re-implementation we had taken this policy out, we repealed this policy, and then realized that we, we needed, we, we had taken a portion of it and put it into a different policy, and then repealed the whole thing and realized, oh wait, there's a portion of the policy we still need, and then we went through and made sure that it was up to date. So this policy is about naming of school facilities and mascots. We've had several new schools this year, and the process that this district goes through to name a school is an in-depth process that we wanted to articulate in the policy. So we laid out the procedures that we follow when we name a new school, when we rename a mascot, or when we want to name a portion of a school, a facility, an auditorium, for example. When um, we want to name an auditorium after a member of the community, what, what are the steps, what are the criteria that the committee that reviews these requests will look at. So that's uh, policy 6600. 
outlines the, the procedures and the criteria for naming schools, naming mascots, and naming facilities within our schools. Any questions about policy 6600? Okay. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention briefly, we have a number of policies to repeal on the consent calendar as we're going through and trying to clean up our policies. We're finding that some of our policies are 30 years old and one sentence long. <laughs> some of our policies are outdated that we don't, we don't need them anymore. And so you can see the list of policies that we are repealing, either because they're too short to actually have any substance, because they're so old we don't implement them, or because they've been incorporated into another policy. Um, we do have one more policy that we're putting on the consent calendar in light of our policy policy that the board passed last month. When we make changes to policies that are strictly legislative language that don't have any procedures, there's no discretionary discussion about processes, then we present the policy to the board on consent. Policy 8800, which is the district's learning material and reconsideration policy, has some changes that we had to incorporate due to a sensitive material bill that was passed by the legislature last session. And so we modified some of the language within this policy to align with the legislature. And it, there was no um, process or procedures, just included some definitions and some um, requirements that the state law imposed, imposed last legislative session. So that's on the consent calendar. Any questions about that? Thank you. Thank you. Well done. That consent calendar will help us do it that way. Anything else, Superintendent? Board, anything else that we need to discuss quick? If not, we'll adjourn and come back in about uh, 13 or 14 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>